Hello, boys and ghouls. Welcome to a very special interview episode of Dads from the Crypt. Today, I'm interviewing director Russell Mulcahy. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Um, you are a prolific uh, director in many aspects, especially in the crypt realm, and uh, we'll get to all that in a minute. But first, I like to do some background. Uh, you grew up in Australia? Yes. Yep. Um Grew up in a little town, a small town called Wollongong, which is 50 miles south of Sydney on the coast. Um, yeah, and um, I, I, I remember when I was very young, joined the amateur eight mil film club there, made some crazy little eight mil films, um, and uh, then moved up to Sydney and became film editor at News at Channel 7. And while I was there, I had the ability to, I had the access to an editing room 24 mm. seven, basically. Um, and I started doing music clips, and um, I was one of the, the first people to start doing music videos in 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 Australia in the seventies. Um, yeah, then went on from there, did a couple of short films at the Sydney Film Festival, and uh, the rest is history, I guess. Moved to England, and started doing more more rock and roll video clips. Mm -hmm. So when you were starting to do those little. Uh music clips were you inspired i mean there weren't really any music videos to be inspired by at the time right so what what was fueling that well yeah interesting i think when i was when, I know, actually i know when i was doing them uh i was basically i always wanted to do movies and um i was just been a movie buff since you know first born and then so so I doing doing video clips I was given access to basically make mini little mini movies um and uh and so that was very exciting I could try different ideas and techniques and styles and things I loved um I mean I, and you can see on some of the videos I was even cropping them because in those days televisions were basically a four by three format a ratio a square box mm -hmm. um so I started cropping my videos to give them more of a sort of 185 or widescreen aspect ratio. Um, and I remember the first time I did that, um, MTV in New York called me up and I was in London and they said, uh, yeah, good video, but we've got a bit of a technical problem with it. It's got these black bars on the bottom. <laughs> but don't worry, we're blowing it up and we're going to pan and scan it. And I said, no, 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 it's meant to look like that. Um, and so then it became pretty standard. Um in, in giving that more um, as, cinematic aspect ratio. Mm -hmm. So what were your first, like, cinematic influences? What were the first movies you were watching that inspired you? Oh, my God. Like, uh, in the early days, was uh, I was a huge Fellini fan, Bergman, um, Pasolini, um, Zeffirelli. I mean, Ber yeah, I mean, Kubrick, Ken Russell. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Excellent. Um, and then, I mean, we could talk about your, we could do a whole episode based on your music video career. Cause again, right, prolific is the word that keeps coming up, but uh, uh, just to whittle it down, we got to talk about the, the video killed the radio star, which is, you know, probably the first iconic video may arguably definitely the first viral music video, I would say. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, who knew um, because I've already been doing um it was really the first video that sort of broke MTV. Mm -hmm. um, well, it was literally it, the first MTV video. It, it, well, it was, it was, and uh, what a great song to do. And but who yeah, knew I mean, we, when I was in the studio for that one day and doing this crazy song and crazy ideas, and um, that it would become sort of this iconic flagship of MTV of the opening um, of their music video channel. Um, but the funny thing is, when it first showed on the top of the pops um in in britain in london or england um <laughs> in those days when you when you cut you cut on uh, three quarter inch basically and then it was sent somewhere else and the one inch then was formatted to your your cut that you'd done on three quarter inch and it wasn't a terribly accurate system um so <laughs> The, the, I'm sitting there watching Top of the Pops and they put the wrong take of the girl coming down the tube. And so she mm -hmm. comes down the tube and the tube falls over flat on the floor with her inside it. And I went, whoops. <laughs> so that was quickly remedied. Um, but you, you sometimes you, you do a video in this old editing system and 
the wrong cut would turn up and be, you know, it's um, quite a surprise. Mm -hmm. So again, when you, you, when you like, did you storyboard that? Cause it's just a lot of really cool visual cues just kind of being thrown around. So like, well, how, yeah, do you, yeah. how, how do you sit down to write that? Well, okay. Um, usually I'll be given um, a, a cassette. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this is only very old, isn't it? Um, be given given a cassette of the um, of the song, and I would listen to it. I would really, not even really necessarily listen to the lyrics or whatever, but just find an image that would come to my head that the music sort of brought into my into my imagination, and and then it would stem from there. Um, I didn't really storyboard, but I, I tried storyboarding once uh, for a music video because don't be at these things are shot in a day. Anyway, so I did storyboard this thing. The storyboards were gorgeous, gorgeous, except we spent two hours filming the first shot. No, <laughs> it looked like a storyboard. Right. And I went, no, hang on, we can't do this for the music video because it, the, the time factor is like yeah. we're, we're screaming, we're, we're going to be shooting for 14 hours straight. Um, and we have to finish it. So it really was um, basically what I used to call the organized chaos. Um, you would just get as much material on the stage and some and ideas in your head and, and notes and whatever, um, and hopefully it would work on the day um, because – and the time factor was just, but you, but luckily I would work with a lot of the same people, same costume designer, set set designer, and so there was a there was a shorthand um, dialogue um, would happen, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it comes a through. Just... The hand would mean something, and a flourish of the hand would mean something else. <laughs> I'm only kidding. No, I mean, no, it comes through on the screen, just like the the ingenuity and the creativity, and just the kinetic energy. Yeah, yeah I mean, like for example, when we when we did the Duran Hungry Like a Wolf and Save a Prayer in Sri Lanka, um, there was myself, a friend Marcel 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 Anciono, and Eric Fellner. Um, and we just got in a bus, a little van, and drove around Sri Lanka. And if you drove around, we'd see little locations and this and that, and we'd write the basically write us a little script for each song. And we drove around the whole island. We got back, and then the band turned up, and then we ran, went around the island again, filming. Mm. And each location, we would change their costume, do a bit of save a prayer, a bit of hunger of a wolf. Um, whenever we had some elephants or some um, young Buddhas and Buddhists, um, yeah, it was um, that was that was exciting. The, right. the thing about doing those videos in those days it was, I felt like this. Um, not only just a filmmaker, but also a very privileged tourist in a way with a very big camera. And mm -hmm. I was just going to these wonderfully exotic, strange places and um, just beautiful places and, and doing sometimes insane videos and whatever. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of just the music video uh, medium. And I like that allows you to do things like that and just kind of, you know, you don't have to worry about the bigger things that would come with a full TV show or a movie. You can just focus on the concept and see if magic just kind of happens. Yes. Yes. And sometimes, yeah, you know, there were times when the magic didn't happen. Um, right. Luckily, luckily um, for the really good songs um, and, and the really wonderful artists, the magic did happen, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Moving on to a different kind of magic. Uh, I, want to, I want to talk about Highlander. Um, oh, okay. How, how can we not? <laughs> Um, See? I watched both Highlander one and two. I haven't. Oh, I haven't never, I haven't might, seen... Let's let's talk about two. Well, I, I want to make an observation, which okay, I want to see what your opinion on, is on. So I I haven't seen both of them in their full. Like I've seen them on TV and whatnot. So this is the first time sitting down and just watching them all together. And I thought it was really interesting how the openings for both movies are very similar but kind of mirroring each other. Mm hmm. Uh, it's an interesting juxtaposition. So in the first one, you have this like amazing sweeping shot of the uh, Madison Square Garden, yes. where he's watching this like modern staged uh, combat <laughs> of a WWF true, rat, uh, true, true, true. Yeah. match, and he's kind of sitting, McCloud sitting back as the observer of this happening. And then right. in the second movie, we have almost the kind of a mirror of it, where it's a dilapidated opera stage, and you have this 
upper going on but there's like buckets of water and you know again the cloud is sitting back as the observer of mm -hmm. what's happening um was that like an intentional that, 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 mirroring that is that is a very relevant observation um but um to be quite honest i mean i'm very i'm, I'm, pr I'm proud of highlander one and um highlander two um, um is a little painful yeah, I mean, I think uh, again, as our friends like Gil and Al went through their pain with Bordello of Blood, I think you know that that's that that, that happens in in the careers. I think in any career, we there's have nothing wrong with Bordello of Blood. Oh, <laughs> they do the whole podcast about everything wrong with oh, that. Okay, but I like I like the film. Yeah, well, you're you're one of the few. Then. Wow. <laughs> um, no, it's it could be worse, but definitely could be better. But that's all. Again, that's a whole other thing. Um. Anyway, we went to a podcast about Highlander, Highlander Two. It's 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 cathartic. You should talk to them about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'm okay. a therapist. No, yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's very therapeutic. No. Um, but so let me ask, what attracted Sean Connery to this project? Um, the paycheck was good. Um, <laughs> but no, but also I think he he loved the character. Um, mm -hmm. he was just wonderful to work with, and we only had him for seven days. Mm -hmm. Um, so he just he just once that costume got on him, he just became the character. Um, but I remember the first time I met him at the Savoy Hotel. I said, "Okay, you're gonna be Sean Connery." Went, "Oh my God, James Bond!" Yeah. Like, and um, and I'd grown up with him as James Bond, yeah, you know, of course. Um, and uh, so I knock on the door, and the door opens, and there the fuck he is, and I'm fuck sake. But then he was so. So endearing and so wonderful, and uh, we sat down, had a cup of tea and some sandwiches, and just had a great old chat for a couple of hours. And uh, yeah, it was great. Mm. It's true. Um, but it was amazing doing that because t seven days, and thank God, this is all testament to Christopher Lambert too. Is that mm -hmm. uh, as we went to different locations to get, get all Connery's footage, we would have to shoot over Chris's shoulder of Connery's footage. And then come back a couple of weeks later and shoot Chris's because we didn't have, we didn't have time to shoot both angles right. sometimes, and come back a couple of weeks later and Chris would perform to a double. Yeah, um, yeah you can't you can't tell it actually he did, he did a great job, but um, that was just the time constraints and um, I remember the last day of Connery. Uh, yeah, we were, he, he said, you're not going to finish, you're not going to finish with me. And you know, if, if, if you go over, you know, it's going to cost him another two, quarter of a million pounds. And I said, okay, stand there. I had three cameras on him. I said, uh, turn left, turn right, laugh, lift up the sword, put the hat on, do this, that, that, that pop in the frame, pan around. And I, I was doing all this and screaming all this for like a couple of minutes, looking at my watch and said, and that's a wrap, you're wrapped. <laughs> and I had to watch the fucking second hand. Um, and he went he looked at me and said, You bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't like flub his lines or something to show yeah, Exactly. <laughs> no, no, he was fun. He had a real down slump of dreadful films. Mm -hmm. Um and then um he did Highlander and then he done you know, did some really great films, you know, the Hunt for October and the um Untouchables mm -hmm. and some really good shit, you know. Mm -hmm. Um and then he did one film. I think what was it called? League of Incredible Gentlemen. Or yeah, and he that that made him. He said after that he said he'll never do another movie. Yeah, and, all, and then he also passed on Lord of the Rings, doing Gandalf. Yeah, I think that one film really sort of deflated him so bad. Yeah. Know? Um. All right, I've got some listener questions for Highlander. Um, okay. how did Queen get involved with the soundtrack? Uh, what was your original idea for that, and how did you react to it? Well, I mean, it, um, it was my idea. I mean, because um, I hadn't necessarily, well, I hadn't worked with them, but I, I, I worked with, um, I, I, fed, I was partners with a guy, the guy that did videos with them, um, and so I said, well, let's try to get Queen. Maybe I'll come and do a song. Um, so they came into the edit room into the theater and we put together like a 20 minute reel of various scenes and they all came in the whole band came and they watched they went okay um we're gonna get we're gonna give you five songs 
but I what? Yeah, it was amazing. It was um, we thought we were going to get some one fucking song. <laughs> and it was just, it was just so wonderful. It, was, it just it was the same of a really great friendship with with Freddie and Roger and uh, yeah. Well, what's even funnier is that on we'll get to your crypt episodes soon, but when the um, oh, he's music, on the second hour, yeah. yeah well, the uh, the music producer or director, uh, the music supervisor for one of your episodes is Brian May, and I thought it was the Queen Brian May. No, no, it's the Mad Max Brian May. It's the Mad Max Brian. No, I like I had to go look that up immediately. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. One more Highlander question. Okay. What do you feel would be the ultimate prize for being the one? at the end would it be being able to finally you know shake off your mortal coil would it be ability to have a family and children or something godlike yeah it's funny you mentioned that because i never really thought about that because the, um um because they all these all these immortals are struggling through the centuries killing each other wanting the prize mm. it's like top chef <laughs> and, and they and they're gonna write up in Food and Wine magazine. Um but that'd be a reality show. Exactly. But you could do a reality show with Highlight though, couldn't you? And mm -hmm. and, uh, and each week someone gets their head cut off. Exactly. So that, that'd make a great show. Yeah. We need some volunteers, of course. Yeah. Anyway, um yeah, I thought what was the prize? The prize basically just became mortal. So well, it depends on which movie, which which movie you look at, because they change it a couple times. But well, yeah, I, ne I never, I never saw the TV show because I couldn't understand, um, I couldn't understand how you could do a TV show with all these. Did, did immortals keep, keep turning up? Yeah, exactly. That's what I always find so funny about that series. And I don't know about the show, but at least in the movies, they're all men. Which I don't know what what if that's a commentary on something. On right, that wouldn't hubris. happen now. But, that wouldn't happen now. It'd be all be all women now, wouldn't it? Well, I'm just saying, it's just an interesting commentary. You got a bunch of men running around with swords. Well, yeah, probably, shopping probably, women, women, probably the ladies are too smart to do that, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Probably got better things to do than run around chopping heads. They're like, off. we got our powers. We don't need, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> our next buffoon, buffoons running around the mud. And God. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's talk crypt. So you are, you are tied for the most prolific. Uh, Tells the Crypt director with four episodes. You're tied with the uh, legendary Elliot Silverstein. Uh, Elliot, who, who's who's Elliot? Oh, Elliot, really? Yeah, you both did four. That's the most. Hang on one sec. I'm just going to do a little technical. Mm. Oh, really? So I, I, I look like, yeah. So when did he do his first one? Um, I have to I was 91, I think. Yeah, he did it a little bit earlier. Yeah, he started, he started, I think, the same season you did. Um, that was how, three. Yeah, how did you get involved with Tales? Okay, I, um, I got involved because I, I'd just done a film with Joel Silver mm -hmm. um, called Ricochet with Denzel Washington. And uh, we had a great time making it and uh, talking about the film is a different story. But it's, um, and, um, so then they said, I'll come and do a Tales from Crypt. Okay. And I did the first one, and um, I guess they liked it. I loved doing them. They were just fantastic. Um, so actually, Elliot Silver, he did his first episode was season three, episode seven. Your first episode was season three, episode 11. So he beat you uh, by four episodes. So your first episode, again, season three, split second with the amazing Brian James, Michelle Johnson, and Billy Worth. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, with uh, when they're in the lumberjack camp. So uh, I was wondering... Uh, yeah, shot up in Griffith Park. Yeah, I was going to ask you where you where you filmed that. So yeah, that was in Griffith yeah, Park. Actually, the, the thing about the tales um, is that there's a, there, was a, there was a production designer. I've got a, Greg Melton. Mm -hmm. He did all of them. And most talented production designer, unbelievable guy. Because consider this, I mean, every week yeah. he'd be doing a new show and this director would come in with these fucking whatever ideas and da 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 and he, then he would turn it into his magic and just come up with his stuff. Uh, you never have to worry. He would just, um, you would just collaborate with him 
And then he'd say, okay, I'll see you next week. <laughs> Be like, yeah, just wonderful man. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, you have a lot of, you have chainsaws, you have axes going off. Did you have to get like a chainsaw consultant? Did you hire um, like a professional lumberjack? No, 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 no. I think I, I think maybe we had we had a double for like you know when we were doing the axe the axe mm -hmm. stuff chopping the log with the axe. We had a um, a professional guy who could really do that. So um, who looked the same physique mm -hmm. as, as Billy? Um, because that guy was really fucking chopping wood, and yeah. I was it was terrifying to watch because I was thinking, oh, the feet are so, it was, it was so, dangerous, it was so dangerous to me. It's like, damn. I mean, these days it would all be CG, but um, yeah. No, you, you uh, can definitely tell that they're just going. That was real. That. The, yeah. the funny, I remember um, the, during that episode up in the, and the last thing we did of the whole show was Griffith Park. And I remember the afternoon when we, we did the thing where they're slicing the guy and they push him over. He's like a sushi roll. Mm -hmm. Um, but when he's sawing away and the kids are going to get spurred with blood, I'm I'm doing the blood. Like I sort of like doing that sort of stuff too. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm spurting the blood. And so at the end of it, we all said, fantastic, fantastic, great. All right. And so that, and it was, that's a wrap. So I get in my car and I drive down to West Hollywood and I pop into a 7 Eleven. And the guy dives below behind his his desk, and I didn't want what. And then I looked at myself, and I am covered in blood. Yeah, I mean, I look like Carrie. Yeah, and I went, "Oh my god, it's movie blood!" Oh my god, oh my god! <laughs> I didn't realize I'd driven all the way home, just completely covered in blood. No one told me. I think they all thought it would be rather amusing to watch. That's so funny. Um... Yeah, I remember reading that. I think Kane Hodder, who plays Jason in the Friday movies, like went to a dentist appointment or something like that, and he had like some of his prosthetic wounds were still on, and everyone was freaking out. <laughs> oh, it's all good fun. Yes. Um, and tell me about working with the actors, especially like Brian James and Michelle Johnson. No, they were, they were, they were just terrific. Uh, all three of them, um, Michelle, Brian, and and, and Billy. Uh, the, the chemistry was just terrific, and uh, and and all the supporting cast. I mean, mm -hmm. the casting of, of those shows, you did you, you there was not really a, a weak link in all of it. I mean, the the energy. I think everyone just loved doing those shows, um, and the so the and there wasn't much rehearsal time. Basically, it was rehearsal that morning. Um, you, there was never any read throughs or anything like that. Um, so the, everyone just came with their A game. Mm -hmm. Um and uh yeah, I was it was, was trivial work with Brian, Brian after Blade Runner I was like, oh my god, it's so good. Yeah, no, he's he's one of those under really underappreciated actors that you know. Yeah, never I really know. got his due. I know. Yeah, uh -oh. yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on to the next episode that you did, season five. And that was people who live in brass hearses. Yeah, I I I, I really love this one. I I had a ball doing this one. Um, one because of the cast, yeah, um, mm -hmm. Bill Paxton and um, and Brad um, Brad Dorif, uh, and then Lady Kazan and uh, Michael Luna. So yeah. just I just love the story. Um, I loved just I had so much fun just moving the camera with these characters. Um, uh, the lighting was just what just a, just a really fun episode. Yeah, yeah, and uh, unfortunately, Michael Lerner. I'll get this one right. Michael Lerner just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Oh, I didn't know that. He um he used to be my when I lived up the up the hill. He uh, he was my neighbor. Um, oh, really? Lovely man. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. Question that I always have about this episode. No one and I've asked Alan Gill, and they can't tell me. Right. What was what was with the butter? That was in the script. It, I'm sure it was in the script. Yeah. But um, he's just constantly eating butter. Um, yeah, uh, Bill Paxton's I mean, That's why I, like, I just loved that that quirkiness. <laughs> I remember we, what we did with the butter was that we um, it was a very good prop made. It was basically just sponge cake, mm. um, yellow sponge cake. Um, so he could just munch on that um, because it's such a disgusting concept. Oh, it's so gross. I want some butter? Like that, that kid goes loser. Um, yeah, he wants some butter. Um, but my God. Um, Paxton and those, and and Dorif, those two together. Mm. Oh, Billy, I'm gonna hurt her. I'm gonna say, oh my god. Yeah, um, 
this is one of those episodes I could watch like a whole feature of Bill Paxton and Brad Dourif playing brothers doing crimes. Oh, so good. So good. Um, like, how did no one see this and say, like, let's get these guys in the crime movie? They, like, should, have movie. Movie. they should have done a movie together. You're absolutely right. I mean, it was, uh, and, and that sort of stuff just makes your days a joy filming. Mm-hmm. Um, but the funny story about that episode is, you know, the end shot um, when you pull back and you finally reveal the rotten corpse mm-hmm. of the of the the twin brother. I wanted the thing full of flies inside the van. So this, I mean, whatever. I I had organized this guy who, who claimed to be a fly wrangler, mm-hmm. and he turns up. And he said, well, he, I go over to his car and he's sort of this crunch, it's a creepy looking guy. Wouldn't you be if you're a fly wrangler? And he says, with well, a little problem. And he opens the boot, of the, the boot of the car, and there's these corpses of rabbits. And they're all, they're all dead, obviously, but they're all moving because they're full of fucking maggots. Oh. And... and the stench was, and he said they haven't hatched yet. They haven't like, and the smell was like, oh my, it was like death. So we, we okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, um, having around with a thing full of yeah, magic. Be, be careful about hiring a fly wrangler. You can, it doesn't always work out. Um, yeah, so we did. So then we tried to fan in bits of coffee husks and all that, but it, mm-hmm. it didn't really work. But anyway, um, that was the idea. Yeah. All right. And then another question. I, 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 I guess in those days, I was very much, a, I know it goes, it harks back to the music videos. I was very much a practical effects thing. I mean, normally probably people would like super some flies in there or something or whatever. I don't know. But I mean, I was like, okay, let's get a fly wrangler. Let's get real flies. Yeah. Like, ah. Well, I mean, yeah, Crypt didn't have the budget for uh, CG flies. They would just no, like, just no, put they, some folding music over it, and then uh, yeah. some sound effects. We'll call it good. Exactly, exactly. I think uh, the I think the first CG on, on the, in my tales is in the, in the next episode I did. Yeah. yeah anyway. Mm, yeah. Um, okay. One more question. So there's yes. this amazing shot I noticed while I was watching this episode, where they're panning through Michael Lerner's house. And it's dark, mm-hmm. it's at night, and then you see a little figure running through and you hear a chuckle, which is mm-hmm. obviously an homage to Brad Dorf's Chucky. Right. So, like, how did that concept come about? Oh, I just wanted a little scare, a little sort of like, what the fuck? Yeah. I mean, I like all those, uh, you know, terror in the night and um, um, uh, what's somebody Is it Karen Black with the, with the little voodoo doll chasing around? Whatever that... Um, Anyway, um, yeah, I, it was great. It just moving little shadows and things like that are, are good little scares. Yeah, just that's not that was very unusual for Crypt to have like a little Easter egg like that. So it's, it was very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you have like a doll, or did you get like a person and do like an um, aspect, um, force perspective on it? I, I think I think it was like a little puppet thing on mm. a skateboard or something. I forget. <laughs> yeah. Did Brad Dorf come with Sorry, his own Chucky? Because isn't that amazing? Yeah, and that shows that shows doing very well. I think they're going into their third, third season. season. Yeah, they're filming it right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. Um, I know. I know. I'm good friends with Don. And uh, oh, congratulations! It's yeah, great job. It looks it looks terrific. That show. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, let's move on to your next episode, season six. Let the punishment fit the crime. Catherine O'Hara, man, again well, another. So such an underappreciated actress. I mean, with Shit's Creek, she's I think she's finally gotten her due a bit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, because like you said, yeah, and luckily she found that, and that 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 role was just tailored for her, or she tailored the role to be her. Mm-hmm. I just what a what a brilliant job. Um, but here she's playing very against type, at least what we what we've seen of her. Kind of right. playing, kind of right. playing a mean spirited character. We don't usually see that. Yeah, and, and and the funny thing with Peter Peter McNichol, I mean, I I'd known him. He came to stay with me in London mm. when he was filming Dragon Slayer. Remember, is it Dragon Slayer? Um, I don't know. The film, he did, the film he did in the eighties. 
Um, and his dragons are it, 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 where he slays the big brilliant dragon. Uh, anyway, so he came in to save it, but I never really knew he was that good with comedy. Are you looking up Dragon Slayer? Yeah, yeah, it was Dragon Slayer, definitely. It was? Yeah. Yeah, so he's saving me. Lovely guy, lovely guy, but I didn't really know he had that, that he, he had that um, ability for humor. And yeah. he, his comic timing well, is quite wonderful. Well, yeah, well, then he wanted to do like Ghostbusters 2 and he was really um, Ali, that too. Ali McBeal, who was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So his, his Tommy timing was just wonderful. And, and it was his idea with the notes, which was oh. a struggle <laughs> genius. That sort of like, and I've heard, you know, the, the whole, yeah, that was just. Brilliant um, idea, yeah. And then, and then, like you said, with the with the CGI, we had the guy getting his nose cut off. Again, that was that. I think KMB Effects did that. Mm -hmm. um, and later on, I worked with KMB on Team Wolf, mm -hmm. um, but they did a great job. And I didn't really realize it was going to look that good. It was like just terrific. The the the, uh, the bone cartilage and all that mm -hmm. was so realistic, and for for that early CG. You know. Yeah, for early CG, that was the best way to do it. Was make it quick, just to quick get get the visual in in our yeah. head. And they then sort of build a model, on. they filmed and they timed it, and whatever, whatever. Yeah, so it's semi CG, semi real, practical. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, so tell I me very, about. I was very pleased with it. Yeah, no, it's a great effect. Tell me about working with Catherine, though. Oh, it's just terrific. I mean, um, again, you know, the chemistry between the two of them was wonderful. Um, and then you got Mike. Is Michael? No, who's the who's the judge? Um, uh, oh, Joseph Mayer. Mayer. I think it's Wall. I mean, it was Joseph Mayer. Yeah, Joseph Mayer. Mayer. Yeah. Mayer. Lovely, lovely actor. Um, I use him later on in um, in the Shadow mm -hmm. um, for, for for a role. Um, but um, no, she she was terrific. She really got into it, and uh, again. Very little rehearsal, you know. You you get there, it's hi hi. You know, uh, uh, this is the scene, and let's just have a rehearsal, walk through, and blah blah. blah and this is note here, note there. Blah, blah, blah. Off to makeup. Let's light the scene. Um, yeah, it's very. Again, th these actors just bring their A game, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to me, she, uh, to me, she was you know Kevin McAllister's mom in like Home Alone or Lydia Dietz's mom in Beetlejuice, like. She always has this like Midwest nice mom vibe to her. Yeah, but it was nice her playing the sort of like a bit of a decayed lawyer. You know? mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. So, speaking of more in the broader sense of this episode, do you think this was like a kind of a purgatory she was stuck in? I guess. I mean, um, it's probably. I mean, yeah, I, I, it's a bit like um, The Shining when you, you've always mm. been the caretaker. Yeah. You know? um, so it's just the generation that she'll she'll now take over. It's it. It's a it's continuation of this horror that goes on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a, that's such a great episode. I was, I was watching it last yeah, night. Yeah, the, the payoff is good. That the fact that he sort of electrocutes himself. Yes. And she's like, yes. and then she becomes semi dressed like him. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, it was fun. It was good. Yeah. All right, and then that season seven horror that was, in the night. That was not that was ninety four, yeah. Oh no, that was like ninety six. Ninety six was it? I mean, yeah, because that was the last season. No, 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 because we next season we did in London. Yeah. Oh, so it's not. Yeah, it's ninety. It came. Well, it came out in May of ninety six. Which way are you talking about? The, the last one, horror in the night. The oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, London. I was talking about Left the punishment. It was ninety four. Yeah. And um, then, so, well, go ahead. Your horror, horror in the night, yeah, yep. Um, which is, and they and they moved to London for this one. Mm -hmm. we, we shot this 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 season. Um, I think all the I think the whole season was shot in London. Yep. So, which I know was like a big change for a lot, at least a lot of the regulars. But was that easier or di more difficult for you? Well, well, they brought they brought Greg Melton, the production designer. Mm -hmm. He came and Gil, obviously, um, but everything else was new. I think GP was new and really, really fucking good. I forget his name, um, but yeah, uh, Elizabeth McGovern. My God, yeah, she's done some very cool stuff. Um, 
Ronan, I think I think he's passed away, and James Wilby. The, the the I had uh, this episode. Two things I'd just done. What, 96, 96. Um, yes, a couple of years beforehand, I'd just done a film with Michael Caine mm-hmm. um, called Blue Ice with Michael Caine, Bob Hoskins, Ian Holm, fucking Sean Young. <laughs> HBO film wasn't really cin- wasn't for cinema, it was for HBO. Um, anyway, so and I'd shot in this wonderful location that the pub that you know the beginning of the um. Of the Tales of the Crypt episode that, that where the train goes, you see that pub. Mm-hmm. But I've done I've done a whole s- major scene in that lovely location. It was actually became my favorite fucking location in London because you could time a train with your crane and everything. The trains mm-hmm. were very that was London Bridge. Okay. The only, the only problem is when we did the Michael Caine thing one day, there was a bit of a terrorist attack on the bridge, so oh, no. they stopped the train. I was like, oh no, um, but. Uh, so I was really happy to say, oh my God, I can use that same location. Um, yeah. And then it was so much, I, I, at that point I was known as the bucket of blood director. <laughs> and, and you can see in that episode, I had a good time with blood yes. and other, other bodily fluids. I had oh. more. I was like, I think, I think James, it's any time, uh, uh, it was like probably like 4 a.m. in the morning. It was winter. It was freezing cold on the stage. And I'm pouring blood on him, which is probably very cold. And I'm having a great time. And he's sort of like, he got a little angry with me. <laughs> he's fine by the end. But he's like, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, hour 14 or 15. And he's like, fuck. <laughs> right. Um, and then this was also written by John Harrison. He right, did, like uh, tell us on the dark side, and he did like the music for a creep show and Day of the Dead. Um, right. Did you collaborate with him at all on this, or did he just kind of turn in a script and hand it over? Yeah, just turn the script in. Mm-hmm. Um, I watched it again the other day. I mean, visually, it's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it makes any sense. Yeah, it's another one of those. Is this purgatory? Is it what? What's going on? Yeah, so he's in. He's in, he obviously was a hitman. Maybe it was not clear enough that it's him going. In. Do you understand that it was him shooting himself? Was him? He comes in and shoots the girl. A young, a younger him. Does it make sense? Uh, kind of. I mean, I guess I kind of got that. I, guess but... I, should, I should have probably gone in for a closer shot because um, it's the same actor or whatever. Um, but I was sort of there. So he he goes there and he's basically just reliving sort of. She's dead, yeah. So she's yeah. a ghost, yeah, yeah. But it's like, how did he know that? That why did he go to the same hotel? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of yeah. Logistical this questions. This is the one but... I was watching it again. Um, I was wondering. I was watching it again. Now, did I confuse it, or was the script just confusing? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I think a lot of season seven, and it's generally regarded to be not up to par with a. Most of yeah, the other, other stories, like uh, people live in brass hearses and, and whatever, they're very sort of pretty straightforward mm-hmm. horror stories with a bit of a twist, you know, mm-hmm. and a really good, fun twist. Um, this just seemed to be twist upon twist upon twist, but and, and like, oh, wow. Well, yeah, it's kind of again, speaking of our friend, um, uh, Stephen Hopkins, like. The thing in Nightmare on Elm Street movies is like you can have the fake outs where you think you're in a dream, but you can't do it too many times. Right. On top of each other. There's like a limit before the before the aunt is just like, we're just not gonna believe anything. Well, but, Doctor, what is the limit? Yeah, exactly. Oh, I mean it kind of yeah. depends. But yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a little bit no, more. You're, you're absolutely right. And I think that was the problem with um horror in the night. It it was overkill of the um the dream. Oh, wake up. Yeah. Wake up. What's yeah. Yeah, except after a while, the audience just doesn't believe it anymore. Right. So we're like, oh, this is just a dream. So I think just just go to the bathtub bursting with blood. With that's all. <laughs> that's all great. You know. But it's. I mean, it's still like I said. It looks great. It's well acted. No, no visually, it's fun. Yeah. And if you just like, don't try to follow the story, you'll probably have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I want to talk about Teen Wolf. Um. But I'm not, I admit I haven't seen it. So I uh, talked to some friends and I went to Reddit and got some questions. 
So I don't quite understand the law of this. With the TV show? What? With the TV show. Okay. And, and the movie. So uh, first off, my friend Alyssa, she has actually a There's werewolf. 100 episodes. You can, you can catch up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I'll put my kids to bed and go uh, watch. Oh, yeah. um, so my friend Alyssa, who has a podcast about werewolf movies called The Silver Scream, wanted to know um, how did things change when the show started to get more popular in season two? Um, I think <clears throat> the actors just um matured a bit. I mean, I think we just developed characters more. I mean, Dylan took a sort of a bigger role, um, um, and uh, and and Tyler Posey uh, just um became sexier, um, but also we just started introducing more different villains and um more sort of uh, psychological problems to you know to deal with because mm-hmm. uh, so, the first bit is a pretty straightforward love story right because the movie the, the original movie the 80s movie that, oh yeah but I, no 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 you cannot there's, there's to, that, that's a comedy yeah exactly that's what i was gonna say that that's a comedy and then we're going on this like much harder darker yeah yeah, yeah. um no yeah the only difference is that um they got the rights to the title, and you could use Scott McCall's name um, and the Beacon Hills. That's all from the movie, the comedy, the Michael J. Fox film. Mm-hmm. That's where the difference. That's where it stops. In, 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 right. in, Team Wolf, the TV show, is serious. Yeah, mm-hmm. with some humor, but it's basically sort of a creepy, sh- creepy, sexy show. Right, creepy, sexy show. I like that. Yeah. That's yeah. a good genre. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, the so we, so, we, used to, we used to say, uh, let's be surprising, sexy, and scary. Yeah, I mean, a lot like Crypt in the way, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, how did the mix of unknown young actors and the experienced older actors, uh, how they get along on set? Um, they, terrific. I mean, um, they, I think. The older actors sometimes like seeing the energy and the inventiveness of the younger, so one experiment a bit mm. more. Uh, but also, the, the younger ones have also respect, and so there's a there's a <clears throat> there's a sort of a balancing that goes on, and it usually works out. Um, I remember my first film, Razorback. Day one, I had. Two actors, Chris Hayward and David Argue, played the, the Benny Dicko brothers, fucking maniacs. And then I had Bill Kerr, this old Shakespearean actor, Australian actor, do the scene. And Bill Kerr comes in, da da da, starts to, and David starts improvising. I mean, fabulous shit, but improvising. And Bill is just like waiting for his line to come in, <laughs> as you do on stage. And he goes, I can't do that. <laughs> so then we had a little meeting and everything was fine. But yeah, this, that was an extreme example. It was a good uh, day one. It was like, first day, oh, okay. All right. No campaign 4377 asked, what is your favorite villain arch in the in the show? Oh. Yeah, Dylan Hodge. Um, well, I, I do, I do like, I do like um, Peter, um, uh, in in episode eleven, season one, episode eleven, at the at the prom, when he attacks Lydia, and then Styles runs in and pleads for her life. I mean, I just mm-hmm. thought. That, that, and then he, and then he burns at the end. I mean, that, I thought the episode. I thought he was just terrific in um, season one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, if there was going to be a season seven, I the... like the Callian. There's a, there's a lot of characters that I do like. You know, I like the the witch woman, whatever her name is, in season five, whatever, four or three, whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> If there was I, mean, gonna... I, did, I did. I did like forty-seven of those. Yeah. Again, you're you're just prolific. <laughs> it was. It was good. It was. Uh... Let's see. If there was going to be a season seven, what cultural mythos would you pull inspiration from? Oh. Oh. 
Well, you know, I mean, that'd be interesting. I mean, the Gorgon's never been that. I mean, I do like Greek mythology. I mean, I don't, I don't know if the Gorgon's ever been that well done. I mean, it's quite well done in, in the Harryhausen in right. the Titans. Um, is that if that's what they're talking about? What what is that the question? Um, yeah, like what what cultural mythos would you pull in for another season? Oh, for another season, or just uh, I don't uh, know. Theoretically, yeah. don't know. All right. <laughs> Um, did you enjoy being able to have the actors swear in the movie? Sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it brings real joy to me to someone, hear someone say fuck on TV. Um, there was well, certain... not have to dance around it. Huh? Uh, uh, like, was there a relief not having to dance around the censors? Well, I mean, I guess so. I mean, uh, no. it, the, the, the show never... The show on TV never really required it, you know. It was mm -hmm. like it was just um, get, let's move, the story just was moving along so fast, and uh, um, um, yeah, I mean, it, it it made sense in the movie because it's fifteen years later, the kids have grown up and they're old enough to swear. Right, <laughs> very very exciting to be, to be able to swear. Um, again, I, this is from... whole, I find the whole thing ridiculous, but anyway. Well. Yeah. Right, this is Sadie Lotus. Uh, are there any plans for another movie? Um, not at the moment with the writer's strike. Well, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> um, but uh, and you know, good luck to the writers. Um, mm -hmm. Best. Um, or would you be? Not, would you want to do one? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, there. You know, I mean. Uh, it was it was it was tough uh, um, the, with the movie in that um, the idea of bringing Crystal back was I think a, a really good idea, um, but there was uh, I think everyone there were so many avenues we could have explored, but you just don't have time in a movie. You know? Even if the movie is two and a half hours long, um, and we had so many bloody characters in that movie. I mean, maybe next time we'll have less characters. Yeah. All right, and then um, here's a good one. This is from Radiant Fox Boy. Who were your favorite Teen Wolf couples? Um, I I I I always loved the uh, what do you call it the the the, the Styles and Lydia no man's <laughs> I mean, it was like this romance was never going to really happen, but that was sort of was happening. It was like. And eventually they do come together and then it's like, oh my God, it's just, I think it's the most wonderfully happy, sad relationship to watch. And I just love those two actors. Um yeah. And also it was good having the the the, the gay the gay guys. It was it's wonderful having um a, a gay relationship in that show. You know, that was mm -hmm. I, I felt that was really good. Nice. All right. And then again, quoting another one from someone from a fan. They said, uh, most important question, why did every male character in season five need to have a hedgehog haircut? Um, because it's sexy? I don't know. <laughs> um, I didn't really, I didn't really, um, dictate the haircuts. I think that was actor's choice. Um, and what was hot at the moment at the time, um, and you know, listen, all the, um, the, the you know, obviously the girls look great, but the boys, the boys wanted to look, you know, they wanted to look hot. Mm -hmm. They're normally covered in you know spritz and sweat and shirts off, and you know, it was that sort of show. <laughs> nice. All right, let's move on. Uh, we'll be wrapping up with some of our traditional miscellaneous questions. In the first episode of Tales from the Crypt, William Sadler walks into a diner and asks for a cheese sandwich. If you were going to walk into a diner and ask for a cheese sandwich, what kind of cheese would you want? Wow, I, I would um, I would get a um, I would change it slightly. I'd get um, some brie with ham on a very fresh baguette. Nice. Yeah, I love a good brie. 
Mm -hmm. We all have a good brie. All right. And then, uh, you know, we're dads from the crypt. We give we like to give dad advice. Um, what mentor mentorship advice would you like to give our audience? What what successful knowledge would you like to pass on? Um, just fo follow your dreams. Um, work hard. You know, um, don't don't go out and people, you know, just work just work hard and follow your dreams. Um, because uh, they do happen. They, it's all there for the, you know, um, yeah, yeah, just, um, yeah, that's it. All right. And then uh, I know things are kind of slowing down right now because of the strike, but do you have any uh, projects that you're hoping to work on as soon as things get cleared up? Yeah. I mean, there's, um, there's a film in, um, in Vancouver in, in August. It's a action thriller. Um, but again, who knows? The uh, you know, the directors may go on strike. So we'll see. Can you tell us anything about that? No. Okay. <laughs> Stay tuned. Okay. No. That's You've got many episodes of um, Team Wolf to watch. You know? I know. I guess yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe I'll get with my friend and uh, I'll she'll show me some on her podcast and I'll. Uh, yeah. I'll, watch I'll episode be... one, then watch episode. Uh, uh, well, it's a good episode. and then watch episode 10, 11, 12. One, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll do that and report back. Excellent. All right. Um, Russell, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Where can people find you to follow along? Um, I'm on Facebook or Instagram. Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent. Okay. Well, that wraps up everything. Uh, again, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you taking your time to talk to us. Pleasure. Uh, and uh, yeah, you be well and um, yeah, go daddy. <laughs> All right. I appreciate everyone for listening. And with that, we thank you for listening to Dads from the Crypt. <laughs> Follow Dads from the Crypt on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or I will follow you to the grave. <laughs> no, seriously, you really should watch. But be careful what you ask for. You may get it. <laughs>